This week on Crossfeed. Red Cross, fine. But no Maroon Cross. And no Cross Monuments. What about religious freedom? Even for evil Muslims? I don't know. Ask Jesus. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hi, I'm Pastor Jim Butler from St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, talking to you from Construction Zone Central. Jim has a really crazy way of, uh, of you know, doing vacation and all that. Yeah. So, for right now, my wife and I have just torn apart our kitchen, and we're redoing it. Um, two, I was just showing, I won't, I won't bore everybody by showing them the guided tour that I gave Dale, but uh, two of the walls are, are down to studs. Sorry. Um, so. <clears throat> hey, today is Mark's two important um, uh, deaths, actually. Um one is it's been 20 years since Jim Henson died, and um, which he's really missed. And uh, the other one is it is today, this morning, uh, Ronnie James Dio died of cancer. You know who Ronnie James Dio is? Uh, probably best known as lead singer, uh, one of the lead singers of Black Sabbath. Uh, also had a, a few other bands, uh, one named after him, all right? But Ronnie James Dio is credited with the goat's head symbol, uh, the, the hand thing uh, that is used. So um, he, he wasn't a Satanist, uh, but he wasn't a Christian either. Uh, he was kind of a universalist. Jesus was a good guy, and, and there's lots of other nice people out there too. Um, but uh so yeah, two uh two sort of two deaths they have nothing to do with each other <laughs> are twenty years separate, but uh they're both I'm I've been a fan of, of Dio's music for since I was a kid and um and uh and of course who's not a Jim Henson fan. It's not that easy being green. True. True. Well I'll tell you what, there there's some people out there who are not cross fans. Hmm. Uh, I don't know about Jim Henson fans, but stuff. So I guess let's start off with the Mojave Desert because we've talked about this one before. Yep. Um, as more of an update, there's this uh, cross out there um, in the Mojave Desert, and it's on uh, federal land. Um, and it's been there for 78 years. So it was put there by the uh, uh, Veterans uh, Foreign War, uh, <clears throat> and. Um, it was there, put there to honor all the dead and who, uh, all people who died in, in war. So that was the idea of it. And, uh, so some people griped about it and, uh, our friends, the ACLU sued, uh, this, the, the, uh, government, uh, gave the land <laughs> in the middle of this national forestry or whatever it is, gave this, you know, two by two foot plot of land, uh, to the VFW and, um, Made it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sent it back down the circuit court and said, um, on remand and said, hey, number one, you, you didn't take that into effect. The fact that the, the government gave the land is now private land. Um, and that, uh, really they argued, um, that this is not a, um, Christian symbol. Um, uh, uh um, uh, here is, uh, um, Justice Kennedy wrote here, uh, one Latin cross in the desert evokes far more than religion. It evokes thousands of small crosses in foreign fields, marking the graves of Americans who, who fell in battles, battles whose tragedies are compounded if the fallen are forgotten. Um, basically, what he's there, they argued is, is that this cross, um, is not really a Christian symbol as much as it's a symbol of American civil religion. I got a bad feeling about this. Yeah. 
The cross is not a universal symbol of sacrifice, symbol of one particular sacrifice, and that sacrifice carries deeply significant meaning for those who adhere to the Christian faith. That's from um, Stevens. That's his, his counter to that. Yeah, just that uh, uh, the guy who stepped down so we can have Kagan. Anyway, um, we won't go there that direction, though. Uh, 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 now, it's interesting. There's, there's an interesting Carl Esbeck, who is uh, an evangelical Christian. I think, I'm not sure if he's Missouri Synod Lutheran or not. He might be, but I'm not sure on it. Anyway, he he's done a lot of church and state matters. He's 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 an expert in the area. Uh, teaches at the University of Missouri Law School, and he says um, uh, turning the cross into some kind of war memorial dilutes the real purpose of the symbol. They've taken a symbol of the church and turned it into civil religion. This can be bad for evangelicals because when people look at a nativity scene or a Roman cross, we want them to think of the God of the Bible. If these simply become civil religion to Americans, it makes the task of evangelism harder for Christians. Mm-hmm. But yet at the same time, there there is a sign of the cross that's just kind of a general thing of comfort. I mean, uh, there's the, there's the very famous uh, World Trade Center cross. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, it's and government land at this point. Right, but it's well, it's 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 well, whatever. It's I mean, it's a public memorial. But whatever it is, it is. But I mean, people found great comfort in that, even though it's a you know religious symbol. It was, I don't know. It's, it's almost like it's more than that. You Homo sapiens and your guns. So I, you know, I don't know. I, I because I I kind of see it. I I think it, that it does kind of dilute the message. You know, so I. It does. It makes me nervous um, about using this. I mean, because like you go to, um, you you go to a military uh, graveyard, right? Like Arlington, okay, and you don't just see crosses there. You see Jewish stars and and um, crescents and you know, and, and things like that. So. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm not sure. Either. Of course, it doesn't matter now because it's been stolen. Uh, that's uh, you know one of the you know people don't realize that. Um, yeah, that uh, um, that yeah, it um, uh, it was just stolen. Um, What's it? The Tuesday, May 11th. That, that was uh, reported just gone, um, and uh, they were very very. <laughs> Upset <laughs> about this, so um, it's an issue. So we don't know where it is. It's gone right now. So it may be a moot point unless it's somebody put it back up there. Um, but I don't know. Sure, I'm a. I'm, it's kind of like the, the, the you know a few years ago when they ruled against the you know nativity scenes. You know, unless they're sanitized by having Rudolph and Santa Claus there. And I know one guy, uh, Barry Lynn from American Separation Church and State, who's a UCC. Or in UCC, and he said, you know, in his mind, you know, dressing it up with the, the nativity scene with um, Rudolph on the side, he found, you know, himself very insulting because mm-hmm. it's just making it this this symbol of a, a secular thing instead of a sacred thing. So I'm not sure. Um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I think it, you know, uh, um, I, I think, it, you know, but then I remember, you know, seeing like the Christ of the Ozarks down in the Lake of the Ozarks. And, of course, there's the one, the Christ of, uh, the, where is it? Uh, the, the outside, is it the outside Rio? There's the the, the oh, sign. Yeah. That, yeah, there's that one. And isn't there one in, in, like, Indiana that there's a big cross? I think it's, that one's actually on private land. There was a story about it a while back that it's on private land, but it's like, overlooking this big highway or something like that. Or, I don't remember. I can't remember. There was, uh, when I was um, in in Kansas City, there was a, a, a Towers, uh, the Business manage, Business Managers Association, uh, KB, uh, BMA, and so it was called the BMA Tower. And every year at Easter, they would leave on office lights in the shape of a cross on the side of the building. Uh, so that was pretty awesome to drive by and see that. 
I uh, remember that growing up. But, you know, I I don't know. I, I think a lot of people, you know, would see that as a, a comforting sign. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I have my questions, but I, I'm not real hip on the idea of just being dragged down either. Mm-hmm. So maybe our listeners have an idea. Maybe you guys have the, have the answers to all these questions. Uh, if you do, uh, email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, but that's, uh, the, 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 the cross in the desert's one thing. What about a cross on a hospital? Or in this case, on an army hospital? Uh, shout out to my son, Josh, because this is, takes, this question is at Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, where he is currently stationed. And, um, wow. So, uh, Ironic. Evans Army Community Hospital, uh, um, Fort Carson, the landmass of Fort Carson, I think is actually more square, has more square miles to it than Colorado Springs does. Uh, it's, things huge. So, anyway, it, this... uh, okay. go ahead. It's a, it's a, a, a cross. In, it's it's the it's the army hospital and it's their logo okay and it shows uh, uh three mountains um and it says uh it's it's got a cross with like a, a point on the bottom the idea being like a pilgrims you know where you kind of stick it in the ground and then it says pro deo et humanitate uh for god and humanity and um and it's it's maroon colored and uh, by the way, if you're watching the video, I'll throw the um, the picture of it in at the end. Uh, if you just stay on after the end, and uh, but it was uh, this has been there since 1969. It was approved um, it, it on June or on August 6, 1969. And uh, then and okay, so here's here's the description. This is right off of the hospital's website. A silver color medal and an enamel insignia, uh, one in, I don't know why it gives the inches in height, um, consisting of a range of three white mountain peaks surmounted by a maroon cross with a pointed base, all within and in front of an encircling maroon scroll, the upper part inscribed Pro Deo and the lower part Et Humanitate in silver letters. Symbolism. The range of mountain peaks symbolizes wisdom and strength, it represents the Rocky Mountains, at the foot of which the U.S. Army medical activity at Fort Carson is located. In addition, the mountain peaks simulate Indian teepees and allude to the historical background of the area around Fort Carson, which was named for the famed Indian scout Kit Carson. The Maroon Cross, emblem of mercy, service, and physical care, stands for the medical activity. The base of the cross is pointed, or bitch, this is probably like a French word or something, a heraldic term, uh, which had its origin in the spike attached at the foot of the cross carried by pilgrims during the Middle Ages. The spike was struck into the ground, fixing the cross in an upright position to mark the location selected for encampment. Maroon and white are the colors used for organizations of the Army Medical Department. So that's the thing, and, and that's the their logo, and... Um, the uh concentrate pinky concentrate so they want him to get rid of this thing we have uh lieutenant colonel steve woolman who's the um say who he is nope it just says he's just kind of a spokesman in this case okay all right so um he said it's been used since 1969 he said, references to doctors serving God and humanity date to the time of Hippocrates, a pre-Christianity Greek physician. Um, he said, the cross, which has a pointed base, is both an emblem of mercy and a symbol dating to the Middle Ages. Um, whereas Mikey Weinstein, he's the, um, and we've talked about him before, uh, president of the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, says, it's a reference to the Crusades. To the Crusades? Okay, um, and could embolden U.S. enemies who want to portray the war on terror as a Christian war on Islam. You know, Magneto's right. There's a war coming. You sure um, you're on the right side? Okay. 
I'm not, I really, is this, I, I didn't really see this as a reference to the Crusades. I, I, well, he's arguing, it says, um, when pilgrims carried a cross with a spike base to mark the site to, of a camp, he's arguing those pilgrims are the Crusaders. Okay, but there's been lots of Crusaders over the years. Or, I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> lots of pilgrims over the years. So, well, there are a lot of crusades too. I mean, I mean, but I, and actually, only one of which was at all successful. But uh, but the thing is, is that I don't know how you, yeah, you. The question is, is was this used exclusively by the crusades, or was it used at all by the crusades? I mean, because yeah, he's arguing that pilgrims equal to crusaders. Yeah, I guess right. maybe you could argue that, you know, the Crusaders were pilgrims, but not all pilgrims were Crusaders. Right. You know, um, assuming that they actually used that. I don't know that they did. But, I mean, our friend Mikey, he goes on, he goes, this continues to add more fodder to the argument that we are Crusaders. It's exactly what the fundamentalist Muslims want. Well, I got news for you, Mikey. I don't think... The Crusaders have any, the, the, the the Muslims have any idea what's sitting on top of the hospital at Fort Carson, Colorado. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it would be different if they were, if this were like a an outpost. You know, I mean, if you know, if over in Iraq they were using this symbol or, or something like that. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I personally. If that's the fodder that the um that they're using, then wow, how pathetic is that? <laughs> there's got to be something more effective than well, there's this army, this one army hospital over in in Colorado <laughs> that's that's been using this symbol since 1969. <laughs> oh, it refers to God. Oh, wait, we refer to God too. <laughs> I don't know. I just the whole scene, the whole thing, just seems a bit ridiculous. I mean, the simple reality is, is there are, um, you know, the cross, which we already mentioned, is you know used in different places, and so this is kind of tied together. Um, you know, at the same time, how much is it? Is it really connected to Christianity? Well, it, yeah. This, I mean, this is what Christian. Um, pilgrims used, all right, and so it's it's a reference to that. But it's I think it's more the idea that um, that this is a this is a place of of peace, a place of non-combatants, um, you know, a place of healing, you know, that kind of thing. And and the fact that it's a reference to, you know, and okay, is it is it uh, drawing away from the cross drawing away from Jesus is it using it as sort of like this war memorial that it's not really talking about you know um Jesus sacrifice for us um you know i th- i think it's more the idea of cross being a symbol of healing and so it's a symbol of healing you still have your health so i don't know i i guess this is one of those ones where I kind of look at it and go, really? I mean, aren't there bigger fish to fry? Aren't there bigger problems than the logo of some army hospital in Colorado? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize Don't it. Don't you have more important things to do? <laughs> Your hate has made you powerful. Well, I these group, these Freedom from Religion Foundations and, you know, either one. I mean, the one that's up there in, in Madison... You know, apparently they don't have anything more important to do. You know, I, I can't figure it out. I've got more important things to do than worry about this stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, they don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I feel different if I had a, uh, a crescent up there. I don't know. Uh, because, but also, you know, reality is I, I'm even more concerned about how good of care am I getting and how good of care are the guys in the army getting. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, again, you know, did they ever intend to, you know, it's like they're arguing that you know this 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 being up there makes us a says that we are a Christian country or yeah you know, that Christianity is the official religion of um 
but I'm not sure. You know, we necessarily say that or or or, or anything. But uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, of course, it did mention the fact. Well, I did that. That we'll just use as our segue into the next one. Uh, of course, that uh, uh, that they persuaded the Pentagon to disinvite Franklin Graham from the Pentagon for the National Day of Prayer because he said that Islam was evil. Uh, back in two thousand and one, and they said his remarks were not appropriate. Uh, Oh, the other thing is, he said he lodged the cross on behalf of 43 people at Fort Carson, 29 are Protestants or Catholics, one civilian, and the others are enlisted personnel or junior officers. Um, um, they, said they took their tears to him for fear of repository they complained to military officers. Uh, none of them wanted to be down- identified. Well, you know, um, I think he's lying. Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. And um, I'm just going to tell him, you know, Mikey, if you watch this, cough up the names. Be honest. you got to have the courage of your convictions. You know? Yeah, yeah I think they're, they're going to get, uh, you know, if, if there are these people, then... Uh, the the question is, are they afraid of, of, you know, getting in trouble by their officers or are they afraid of getting ridiculed over, you know, making such a big deal out of such a minor thing? Right. I, I you know, I just, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I'm doing this on behalf of these people who, who sought me out, uh, but they don't want to be identified. Well, I got news for you. If uh, it's an official complaint, they should be identified. So, speaking of uh, Franklin Graham and Islam being evil, um, great segues. All right, so this was back in 2001. Uh, Franklin Graham, uh, son of Billy Graham, uh, said that Islam is a very evil and wicked religion. This is, and on um, ABC News' Nightline, he said he hasn't changed his mind about the faith. And this has a lot of Muslims not very happy with him. In that case, I shall have to kill you, shall I? Oh, I don't think so. What do I think? I think kill it. Oh, let's be nice to him. Oh, shut up. So we're not attacking... Uh, this is back back in September 11th, 01. Um, he told NBC News, we're not attacking Islam, but Islam has attacked us. The God of Islam is not the same God. He's not the son of God of the Christian or Judeo-Christian faith. It's a different God, and I believe it is a very evil and wicked religion. That's the, the whole quote. Um, and so he's, he's, he's sticking by that statement um, years later. I don't... Although, although he kind of backpedaled a little bit later in the Wall Street Journal, he said, uh, he doesn't think Muslim believes are evil people because of their faith, but I decry the evil that's been done in the name of Islam or any faith, including Christianity. So there he gets a little bit confused in exactly what he's trying to say. Yeah. What is this guy? Crazy? Uh, <clears throat> that article said the persecution or elimination of non-Muslims has been a cornerstone of Islamic conquests and the rule for centuries. Uh, Graham said that the Quran provides ample evidence that Islam encourages violence in order to win converts and to reach the ultimate goal of an Islamic world. Um, I was having an interesting conversation with some people this week online about uh, differences between Islam and Christianity, and and certainly all kinds of horrible things have been done in the name of Christianity. There's no question about that. Um, They're not the sort of things that uh, that Jesus encouraged. And I think that that's really, you know, you want to talk about the differences between Islam and Christianity, you have to look at the founders. And um, whereas, you know, Jesus, the one time that anybody raised his sword in Jesus' name, Jesus told him to put it away and he healed the wound that was caused by the sword. Uh, whereas with Muhammad, um, you know, <laughs> There's a reason that Istanbul was once Constantinople, but now it's Istanbul. <laughs> you know, because of the Muslims. You know, and Muhammad uh, went into to Mecca and took it over. And and while the Quran does speak against forced conversions, it um, 
Muhammad said something to the effect, I saw a quote that was basically, he said, forced conversions are bad. He did them. <laughs> so it's a bit hypocritical. The force is strong with this one. So, uh, um, you know, it is, I mean, it's important to note that not all Muslims are, uh, have the same beliefs as Middle Eastern Muslims. Um, just as, as not all, um, you know, not all Christians are the Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> In fact, I would question, you know, whether Westboro Baptist Church is really Christian. Um, they certainly don't understand the concept of love your neighbor as yourself. You know, as, as far as this statement, it's a very evil and wicked religion. In, I mean, you know, I would contend that because it's contrary to Christianity, that um, it it's evil. I, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll say it. It's it's of the devil, all right, because the devil promotes um, uh, lies about God, and um, since I believe that it's wrong, then this is something you know, false teachings about God. Yep, the devil's all for that. Is it evil and wicked in a sort of a, a worldly, um, you know, sort of, if you sort of step aside from that and just say, are these nice people? You know, well, you know, it just it depends on which sect of, of Islam you're talking about. No, I'm chaos and he's mayhem. We're a double act. So, I, you know, there, there's plenty of Muslims out there that are nice people. And that they don't agree with all of the the violence and stuff that's been done, you know. They find that embarrassing the same way that um, that we find things like the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition embarrassing. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. I, you know, I, I don't know. I just I understand what he's saying, but I wish he would frame it differently than he did. I mean, you know, you you know, if you think uh, Islam is a wonderful religion, go live in Saudi Arabia and make it your home, or go live under the Taliban somewhere. Um, you know, then then you'll know. Um, but not, but yet, not all Muslims agree with the Taliban. You know, and uh, not all agree with Saudi Arabia. I've known a few people you have to leave there and come to America because of it's uh, because of what it's like. Right. Um, and I just, I don't know. I mean, it's an evil and wicked real. I just, <sighs> that verbiage just grates on my ears. You know, yeah. I don't agree with it. I mean, I, you know, I, I agree with him that it's, it's, you know, as you said, it's, but I just don't think that's a helpful language. No. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the problem is it's, it's certainly not a good way to start a dialogue. Right. Well, it's, it's not going to, Open, I think, make a lot of Muslims real open to hearing the gospel from him. I think it's going to close some doors. Um, you know, you know. I mean, I think he could have. You know, I think it'd been enough to say, um, you know, there. You know, it's it's not the same God. Um, you know, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe that he 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 died on the cross. They, that they reject the resurrection. Um, that alone should tell you it's a completely different place than we are. Mm -hmm. um, but I just don't know. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, 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 he's not the son of God of Christian or Judeo Christian faith. I didn't know the Jews believed Jesus was the son of God. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I got to tell you that the whole, uh, you know, every every time I hear somebody say the Judeo Christian faith, like. There's no Judeo-Christian faith. There's Jews, there's Christians. Do we have some things in common? Yeah, we do. But they are two completely different beliefs. You know, I mean, like, the only thing they have in common, you know, if, if he's going to lump Jews and Christians together, he's got to lump Muslims in with it. <laughs> because Jews have more in common with Muslims than they do with Christians. Right. Well... Uh, if it's, uh, the, actually now you're wrong. We do. It, there is a Judeo-Christian faith. 
we call it the Ten Commandments. It's the law. Well, yeah, but the Muslims are, they basically on some level accept the Ten Commandments too. Now, that could be, but I mean, you know. They just say the Old a, Testament is corrupted and, and, you know, but they do believe, they believe the Old Testament is the word of God, but they believe it's corrupted. Well, because God knows they have the perfect word of God. But let's not move into that. Let's go on here. Um, oh, let's see here. Uh, well, let's let's pick up the this, uh, 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 since we're talking about uh, uh, the, the lack of freedom in Muslim lands, uh, let's talk about this independent panel on religious freedom. I'll let you, did the U.S. United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Yep. And uh, they, uh, this commission is uh, not real happy with not only President Obama, but uh, Presidents Bush and Clinton as well. Right. Um, they say that uh, uh, they're upset with President Obama for a perceived softening of his rhetoric on religious liberty and for failing to name an ambassador for international religious freedom. Uh, suggested the name of 13 nations on the panel uh, that they recommended last year to the administration to be deemed countries of particular concern, or CPCs, uh, for particularly egregious violations of religious freedom. This is not saying that you know these are the only countries that um, that that have uh, religious freedom violations. These are ones that are like the worst. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Afghanistan, Belarus, Cuba, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Laos, Russia, Somalia, uh, Tajikistan, Turkey, and Venezuela. Our weapon is supplies, mm. supplies and fear. And um, so they said that um, all, that all three, uh, Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton, have um, these. The reason they targeted these three is because these are the three that have actually been since this commission was instituted. Um, and, uh, and so they've, you know, they've only been around that long. So they didn't look at anybody before that because it was sort of irrelevant. Um, and, and they're saying, look, we've, we're making these recommendations. You guys aren't following them. And so, I mean, so in a way they're, they're going, you're not listening to me, and we don't like you for that. Um, I mean, at the same time, they've got a point. He has gone unchallenged long enough. So, oh, in, in case you're wondering, there are they're recommending these. Um, that's not that the, these are the only ones. Uh, they they said that. Uh, now, well, let's be reasonable. We can resolve our differences peacefully. Uh, the small point seems to shrink year after year for the White House and the State Department, um, deepening problem despite the fact that religious freedom should be increasingly more important as one of the core considerations of foreign policy and national security. Noted that neither the Bush nor Obama administrations designated any CPCs, or, oh, I'm sorry, designated as CPCs the five countries the Commission has repeatedly recommended for such status, Iraq, Nigeria, Pakistan, Turkmenistan, and Vietnam. Well, if there's a bright center of the universe, you're on the planet that it's farthest from. And and so you sort of have to go through, if you want the whole list um, of the recommended ones, you have to kind of jump around a little bit. Um, State Department has issued an indefinite waiver on taking action under the CPC designation against Saudi Arabia. Um, another designee, Uzbekistan, remains a temporary waiver for action because both are U.S. allies. <laughs> well, if we said that their country is of particular concern because of their problems with religious freedom, then they're not going to like us, and they're our allies, so we've got to be nice to them. <laughs> nice kids, where with them, are we going to do a thing? Yeah, because allies are not allowed to criticize each other. Apparently. <gasps> Apparently not. Yeah, you're right. It's a... Uh, no, I... Well, I don't want to get into it because I, I'm not real happy with our current government and what I see as a real softening 
uh, on the whole area of um, uh, of pressing for religious freedom and pressing in other things. Um, so I'm just uh, trying to stay out of that. But I, I, I do think they have a particularly, I think, strong point there that yeah there is something to be said here about their their um a weakening of uh stuff that's going on mm -hmm. yeah uh, they also pointed out that uh that president obama has given a number of uh, he's emphasized religious freedom and major policy speeches abroad but the administration to date has not demonstrated the intent to break from the practice of previous administrations uh, obama might be undercutting his initial rhetoric on religious freedom. It's noted that during high-profile speeches last year in Egypt and Turkey, Obama repeatedly used the term freedom of religion. But since the speech in Cairo, the report noted Obama has increasingly referred to freedom of worship, um, as has Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in international speeches. And, and, you know, we go freedom of worship, freedom of religion, what's the difference? They said, this could be viewed by human rights defenders and officials in other countries as um, having policy implications. Freedom of worship is only one aspect of freedom of religion, right? So it's not just how you worship, it's, you know, what, there's more to religion than just, you know, how you worship or sort of, we would, you know, where you are on Sunday morning or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, I mean, all right, this is a complicated issue, you know, for a, a head of state. All right, or for a um, for a government, because yeah, I mean, on the one hand, uh, yeah, these people who are allies, we depend on them and stuff, and and we don't want to make them mad. At the same time, you know, is there a point where you say, look, all right, we like you guys, but we're not real happy with what you're doing here. You know, for that matter. What's going on with the United Nations? <laughs> and, you know, and, and why are they not doing something about this? They seem to, of, of course, you look at the Human Rights Council and, and who do you have on the Human Rights Council? It's like China, um, uh, oh, no, I can't remember. It's like the, the council's basically made up of all of the worst offenders. <laughs> now, I'll have, you know, these are really good stalwart defenders of human rights every darn one of them yeah. i mean you don't get you don't get better defense of human rights than you saw at Tiananmen square when they were you know <laughs> killing people on the road you know i think you know what the yeah. problem is just as well as i do so i i mean it's it's really sad um and it, and it's certainly it, it's something it's important that we you know c continue to um, you know, to pray for these people, to encourage our our government, and um, you know, not only the the federal gov the U.S. government or or whatever government, we've got people that watch this all over the world. Um, you know, we've got we've got people that watch this in China. Um, and you know, I'm sure they're going, uh, yeah, yeah. Just don't tell anybody I'm watching this. <laughs> you know, um, and. I just, you know, my heart goes out to the people that are struggling. Um, you know, we had a, included the persecuted in our prayers this morning, uh, in, in our church service. Um, uh, and it's just, when, when you think of, of Christians being persecuted, um, or, or other religions, but, you know, for the most part, you, you go down this list, and by far, it's the Christians that are the most persecuted um, on, on these different lists. And you you look at it, when when you hear about Christians being persecuted, you think, oh yeah, you know, back in the Roman Empire, or you know, or, or something like that. But no, it's it's going on right now, and 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 it's worse than ever. And um, and so we, you know, we want to keep praying for them. And uh, and keep encouraging our governments to respect the you know religious freedom of all people. You know whether they're Christian, whether they're um, whether they're Muslim, whether they're atheist, whatever. The people should not be. It should not be dictated who is allowed to believe what. Right, because it's not like you're really changing 
You're not, you, you can't force somebody in their beliefs. You can force them, you know, to act like their beliefs are different. You can force them to lie about what their beliefs are, right? But you can't force beliefs. And, uh, frankly, in those places where Christianity is illegal, uh, the Christian church, for the most part, is thriving. Um, and at least in the sense, not, not like numerically, um, but, you know, the, the Christians there are, you know, they know what they believe. And, uh, you don't get all the, the kind of goofy stuff that goes on in the Christian church in places like Europe and the United States and, or I should say North America, um, where, where you've got these people sort of nitpicking about the Bible and, you know, and, oh, well, was Jesus really God and all that kind of stuff. You just don't get that kind of stuff where the church is persecuted. All right. Because if that, if, if you're so, um, sort of wishy washy about it, you're just going to go, you know, you're, you're certainly not going to put your life on the line and go, you know, meet out in the, in the woods somewhere to, um, to worship or, or be afraid that, you know, people are, you know, knock down your door and haul you away or something like that. So, and you're not going to, you know, buy Valentine's Day presents in Saudi Arabia. Yes, not. Well, let's go to the end here. And, uh, um, I just, I just kind of just do a story to end on. Um, it says that, um, the majority of Americans believe Jesus speaks to them in some form or another. 52% of Americans say Jesus speaks to, speaks to them by influencing or connecting directly with their minds, emotions, or feelings, according to our friends at the Barna Group, who seem to have nothing more to do than take different surveys of people. It's kind of their thing. Uh, I guess so. Now, it says uh, slightly more than two in five people, which would be... What? Forty uh, percent? Yeah. So just under half, I guess. Yeah. Said Jesus communicates them through the Bible passage they read or that it's read to them. Uh others say it's through signs, sermons, or teachings that address their immediate situation, miraculous circumstances or outcomes, and through words spoken to them by someone else. Well, <laughs> You know, well, Lester Winefit said God communicates through an audible voice or whisper they could hear. I'm trying to figure out why this is news. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would hope, I would hope Jesus would talk to people through the Bible. I would hope he would talk to them through sermons. Uh, that would, you know, I would hope the sermons would address the immediate situation. I mean, I don't know about you. I've had people come to me and say, I felt like you were talking just to me. Yeah. You know, I really needed to hear that this morning. You know, God really spoke through you. Um, uh, I'm giving, yeah, out circumstances or outcomes, uh, or through signs or emotions. Uh, I'm talking to a pastor, a guy, well, he's actually a vicar. He's going to be delayed vicar. He's actually be ordained in July. Anyway, he was, talking about, you know, one of the questions I, I interviewed him for my uh, one of my classes, and I, I asked him, I said, uh, so, you know, why? how did you become a pastor? I, was one of the, I think one of the students asked him, he said, you know, he said, I was, um, I finished up my BA, I, I went out to, I went out and got a, an, an MBA, and um, when I was, before I went out to go get this MBA, somebody at my church told me, you know, you, you should really think about becoming a pastor. He said, and I go, no, not hardly. And he says, and I went out there to, 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 to start my MBA full time. And I went out there and the, the, the church, the, the, where the school was, I'd been there about six months and some people came up to me and said, you know, you really should think about being a pastor. You really have the, these gifts that we think. He says, I was sitting there taking this final and just feeling this awful pressure on me. He says, you know, and I dealt with this pressure for about two or three years. And finally, I, I told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm applying to seminary. You know, I'm, I'm going to go. And she's like, finally, you know, and, <laughs> but, you yeah. know, it was, you know, he said he just, you know, he just felt like God was, was, was dragging him into this. And just like, he said, the Holy Spirit was a monkey on my back for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, I or I have a friend, way, but it was only for about a year. You know, then I have a member uh, here who's leaving. 
Um, and, um, you know, put his house up on the market. It sold in 12 hours cash. I mean, I don't know who has five or $600,000 sitting around in the bank to buy a house, but apparently this, he found one of the few people who do. Um, and, you know, we're just sitting there going, well, I don't know how much, I don't know how much, much, you know, I don't understand what's God doing. I'm not real happy God's, you know, letting you leave, but I don't know how much clearer God can make it. Yeah. So I don't, I'm trying to figure out what this, the, the only thing that I found interesting about this thing was it said, the more the old the younger someone is, the less likely they are to claim that their relationship with Jesus. Seventy two percent of the people sixty five and older say they have a personal bond with Jesus. Uh seventy percent for eight baby boomers, which is really cons- cons- surprising to me. Uh those of us forty six to sixty four. Uh sixty five percent of the Buster group, ages twenty five twenty seven to forty five. And 52% for now, they used to call them the millennials. Now it's the mosaics, ages 18 to 26. Yeah, I hadn't seen that one before. I haven't seen that one before either. Um, which is, of course, my, my, my children's age group. But, uh, you know, yeah, I can, I can see that in their age group. I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure if it's, um, but I wonder how, how different is that from past generations? I mean, there used to be the tradition. Um, of, you know, they grow up in the church, maybe go through high school, they go away to college, and they'd get married, and then they'd show up and say, do you still have Sunday school? <laughs> Those kids is driving me crazy! Yeah. yeah, or, you know, they, oh, my kid needs to get baptized. Right. And But, but yeah, a lot of times they come in for the baptism, and then you don't see them again after that. And then, and then like, oh, Sunday school. Oh, I should really send my kid to Sunday school. You know, and it works that way or, or, you know, or just they eventually go, you know, something's missing, you know, I should go back and check that out. But, um, yeah, they said that, um, adults who are likely to say they have a personal relationship with Jesus tend to be female, 72%, Protestant, 82%. Those who describe themselves as mostly conservative on social and political matters, 79%. And I found none of those a big surprise. Um, Catholics don't tend to use that sort of relationship language in the same mm-hmm. way that, um, that Protestants do. And it's, well, it's not, not even Lutherans tend to. Yeah, yeah. It tends to be more of a, of a evangelical um, sort of thing. It uh, reminded me when um, Paul Simon was running for president, and somebody asked him if he was a born-again Christian. And it's like, well, Lutherans don't tend to talk that way. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, born again. He talked about his own personal faith, but he's just like, yeah, they just don't tend to, we just don't tend to talk that way. Yeah, we just point to our baptism when you say, when you ask that question. So... Oh, really? I just like look at the people and say, you mean there's some other kind? <laughs> there's that, too. <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought the most interesting thing here, that just the, it said less than one-fifth of the population said God communicates with them through an audible voice or whisper that they could hear. And that was kind of the thing that, that jumped out at me the most, that and it doesn't say how much less than one-fifth, but, you know, sort of just the fact that that number is used sort of means, like, we're talking, like, between 10 and 20% of the people that were interviewed said that they literally hear Jesus' voice. And that kind of, like, wow, okay, but is that, like, okay, how many Pentecostals out there? Because they, they tend to sort of emphasize that sort of thing more so. And so yeah. I'd be interested... How many of those people were part of either Pentecostal or part of a charismatic uh, movement kind of uh, church? Although, I mean, I've known people that have, you know, that have told me that um, that Jesus spoke to them, God spoke to them, you know, um, in a in an audible sort of way, or, or they had a vision or, or something like that. And that, I don't discount that, you know. I, I he's God, and if he wants to do that, he can do that. 
He did it to St. Paul, you know. And so if he did it to him, he can do it to other people. You know, I always say, well, just, you know, test the spirits. And, uh, and if it's, if it's pointing to, if it's pointing to Jesus and his forgiveness of sins, um, you know, then, okay, good. You know, the, the um, in fact, the, the times where I get the most nervous is where people have like these merry visions. Um, with, with that, I go, ah, uh, I kind of doubt it. Um, and, uh, or I say, you might have saw something, but I don't think that it was really Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, especially since those tend to be very law focused. Um, and, and the other ones that, that I, that sort of raise a red flag to me is, uh, where it's the Holy Spirit emphasizing the Holy Spirit. And I go, hold on. Holy Spirit never points to himself. He always points us to Christ. And so, if the Spirit is, is, claims to be the Holy Spirit, but is glorifying himself, then that ain't the Holy Spirit. Um, but yeah, if someone says that God speaks to him directly, he's God. He can do that. So, I, I was surprised to see it was that many. Um, and it's, it's certainly never happened to me. Um, but, you know, I've, at least not, you know, not in that sense. I've certainly had plenty of times where uh, I was, you know, looking for direction and the direction came one way or another. Um, you know, with the pastor thing, I was the same way. People kept coming to me and, um, you know, you thought of the ministry, you should be a pastor. And, you know, or people just assuming that I was going to be a pastor and all kinds of stuff. No, 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 no. And, and you know, and finally, okay, fine. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> I don't want to be swallowed by a fish. Yeah, God has a habit of doing that kind of good stuff. Okay, we have a few uh, email messages, so I'll let you share those real quick. Okay, these are actually from... Um, the, these are all from the same person. And they were comments on... Let me see if I can find them now. Uh, on YouTube. And... Uh, this is from, and we've had this before, uh, Torkelson 100, um, on YouTube. And he's watched a, a couple different episodes, which I, <laughs> I don't recommend watching more than one episode in the same day. <laughs> I think the Surgeon General advises against that. <laughs> um, but let's see. The first comment was uh, regarding our, our last episode. Uh, he said, regarding Palin and the God card, some liberals try to discredit a moral proposition from a Christian if it happens to agree with the Bible. You're mixing church and state, they say. Yet every lawmaker's thought process is a very long and diverse bibliography, so to speak. And is the American, uh, and in the American political process, only that which passes the test of reason is relevant to the public policy debate, no matter what the source. Honest, good faith, uh, reason is the final authority in the political debate. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take um, pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? So, and then he, um, this is why America has gotten beyond much of the ancient church state conflicts. I mean, yeah, this is, this is that whole question of, um, you know, our, if, if a, a lawmaker says, this is, this is my rationale for this decision. All right. Uh, because this is my understanding of morality or something like that. And, um, and, you know, there's, there's, the point is, is that you do need to be able to defend it. You can't just say just because I'm a Christian and this is what I think is right. All right. When it comes to lawmaking, you can't do it that way. At the same time, you can't say, I don't believe there's such a thing as morality. And, um, and say, so, you know, we should be able to do whatever we want either. Because then you're, um, you know, either way, you're making decisions based on your worldview. And so, yeah, I um, agree with that. Yeah, another uh, comment also, it was um, talking about Michelle Bachman uh, from Minnesota. Uh, he said, you may not know, but Michelle Bachman is a recent convert to the Wells. She grew up in Waterloo, Iowa, not too far from where I used to be, uh, probably an ALC congregation. That is probably where she made her commitment to Christ at the altar. She 
uh, also graduated from Oral Roberts University, and I believe got her law degree there. And uh, as a link to her Wikipedia page. And so that explains, because we were talking about how she she talks about going to the altar and that and um, and making her commitment there, and we thought, oh, it doesn't sound very Lutheran, especially since she's Wisconsin Synod. All right, but, um, but all right, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, but that's good information. And, and that also explains the story we did on her, oh, a year or two ago, um, where she was confronted on, wait, you're part of, you're Lutheran, you're part of the Wisconsin Synod. Don't they teach that, um, that the, the Pope is the Antichrist? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, if she's only recently joined the Wisconsin Synod, I can understand her, don't know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. A lot of Lutherans, probably most Lutherans, aren't real familiar with that doctrine. It's not the sort of thing that we preach. <laughs> you know, it's a topic for discussion sometimes in Bible class, but it's not this, it's not a, you know, it's never the topic of my sermon. Unless I want to be completely irrelevant. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, this week we're going to talk about the Pope as the Antichrist, because I know that this is something that you're all struggling with, you know. Um, so, so that's, that's good information. I appreciate that. And, um, and we love hearing from, uh, from our, our viewers and our listeners. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and so definitely if you have any feedback for us, you can write to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com, uh, or you can do like Torkelson 100 did and leave a comment on YouTube or any of the other video sharing sites that you're seeing this. So that's all I have for this week, except this is the end of the Easter season. And I'm sad because I love the Easter season. It's my favorite time of year. And, and so which means that this is my last chance to say, He is risen. And, um, and I won't scream it because I've got kids sleeping. <laughs> That's very good. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful week in God's grace. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless you.